Hello, everyone. Welcome to the multiplayer panel. My name is David Kim. This is Michael Scipioni, and this is uh, Aaron Kirkpatrick. We are a few of the members on the StarCraft II uh, multiplayer team. So today, we're going to be talking to you guys about the 2016 major balance design patch. Um, and before we get started, I'd like to point out that we have been working together with our community for the past couple years. So for those of you who have been keeping track of um, our design processes, design philosophies, and the decisions that we made together with you guys, um, a lot of the information that we're going to be talking about today will hopefully not be a surprise. But we still wanted to get into this panel so that we can talk to you guys about uh, the cool stuff that are coming, especially to the people who, are, who haven't been paying attention so that you can come back to StarCraft II and try out these awesome changes. And speaking of which, if you wanted to get involved in working together on StarCraft II, um, we actually have the uh, balance test mat, uh, testing queue on the live game. So if you go to Battle.net, uh, click on the multiplayer tab and the testing sub tab, you can actually queue into it, play some games, and then join in on the discussions. And for the discussions, we have the weekly updates that, that we do on a weekly basis, as you can see on the other side. Um, so you can join in on these discussions, uh, give us your feedback so that we can work together to make sure that uh, StarCraft II is the best game that it can be. So let's get started. Uh, the main goal, as many of you already probably know, is of StarCraft II is stability to promote mastery. And what we mean by this is we want to have a situation in StarCraft II where the game isn't changing so much so that players can feel like th uh, um, they can feel like just um, like my um, number of hours that I put into the game and really like hard work, uh, giving the hard work at practicing the game um, can't be disrupted by uh, major changes that come to the game so often. So that's why we have this goal because we believe the core fun of StarCraft II is really mastering specific parts of the game and then feeling that sense of accomplishment that you get from StarCraft II is unlike any other game out there, is what we think. <clears throat> so how do we get there? And we had balance patches and expansions so far, so let's talk a little bit about both of these things. For balance patches, our biggest goal is to make the smallest changes possible. And the reason for that, like we said just now, is to respect the player's time and, and effort that they put into the game. Um, and we didn't want to make big design changes or big balance changes to kind of disrupt that flow. And therefore, uh, the big stuff we left for expansions. So in expansions, this is where we did the big balance changes and the design changes, and we also introduced new units. And the reason for this is because sometimes small changes aren't enough to solve specific issues. So we needed a place where we make these big changes, and we kind of looked at these as a bit of a soft reset. So players can um, try, uh, play with these changes during the off-season, and we can finish tuning and polishing the changes after the uh, expansion launches during the off-season, and when the new ladder season begins, all the ladder players can go back to that fully competitive experience that they're used to. So now that we don't have expansions anymore, because StarCraft II is a live service game, we asked ourselves, and as we evaluated the game throughout the course of this year, we said, hey, but there are some big issues remaining with the game still. And because we don't have expansions anymore, how can we handle these big changes? Because we're not going to change our philosophies on the more frequent balance changes, uh, balance patches. So we said, what if we were to do a major patch, and we kind of align it as if we were doing uh, another expansion? So we kind of looked at it this as a bit of a multiplayer-only expansion type of deal. And that's why there are such big design changes, big balance changes, as well as we did some exploration on potential for new units as well. So these three things will be uh, what we'll, we're going to talk about today. So before I hand it off to Michael Scipioni to talk about uh, redesign and rebalance, I'd like to just point out that because of the uh, number of changes that we're doing with this major patch is so massive, we can't go into every single change, but we tried our best to make sure that we cover all the big changes. But if you wanted to check out that full list, you can either log on and play online, or you can go to StarCraft2.com and check out the uh, blog that's going to come up right after this panel. 
Hi, everybody. I'm Michael Scipioni. I work on the StarCraft II multiplayer team, and I also work on the campaign team. But here, we're going to talk about each of the races and some of the big changes we're doing with them. Up first is Terran. Specifically, we're looking at Terran Mech. Terran Mech serves as a strategic zone control play style. This is different than Terran Bio, which is more of a multi-pronged tactical play style. So for Terran Mech, we decided to look at what do they have and what preys upon Mech. For what they have, we looked at things such as the Cyclone, the Siege Tank, and the Battle Cruiser. We also looked at what preys upon Mech, especially the relationship between Mech and Protoss with the Tempest. So starting things off, we have the Cyclone. On the live version of the game, the Cyclone acts as a sort of assassination tool. You pick your target, you lock on, and it opens fire. And then you need to keep the Cyclone alive by moving around. It is not a frontline fighter as we see here. So when we were looking at mech, we decided, we thought, what if mech had a armored unit that could come out earlier and give them more map control and fight against early enemy armored units? And so we looked into redesigning the cyclone to do this. In this way, we gave it a new auto attack and changed its stats a bit, as you can see here. The Cyclone actually maintains its lock-on ability for fighting against air units. With this new ground attack, we're hoping that the Cyclone will be able to get map control, and when defending your main stack of units, it can ward away small groups of enemy armor units that might try to pick off your big guns. And speaking of those big guns, let's go to the Siege Tank. On the live version, the Siege Tank does a good amount of damage, but can be overrun when faced with large amounts of enemies. So, since we, I said we were looking at zone control, we decided to make a change to the tank, and I'll let you see it here. Post-patch, the siege tank does a lot more damage. This will make it very dangerous to just walk into an enemy siege tank line if you're unprepared. However, Terran commanders, you have to be careful. And greater damage means greater friendly fire, so you have to be careful with your siege tank positioning. We also, in order to make it more of a zone control style, we removed the medevac pickup ability from the siege tank. So now it's more of a commitment to where you want to siege up and where you want to destroy your enemy. We also looked at the battle cruiser. And with the Battle Cruiser, we looked at its abilities, specifically that right now, Tactical Jump, which allows you to warp anywhere, and Yamato Cannon, which allows you to blast an enemy to pieces, are tied to the same energy. So you have a choice of using one or the other. We made a change where they're now on separate cooldowns, so you choose both. So here, instead of saying, which one do I want, you say, when do I want the battle cruiser to go full power and attack the enemy, or when do I want to use it more defensively with both abilities? We also looked at what preys upon mech. Specifically, the Tempest with 15 range outranges everything in the mech arsenal on live, and this makes it have consistent damage against mech forces, which is very difficult for them to engage into because, again, they have low mobility. So. We took its auto attack and reduced its range, and instead gave the Tempest an ability that, give, that can stun units, but only if you don't move out of the way in time, making it more of a combo piece.
At eight range, the new Tempest actually has lower ground attack range than the Thor, which should allow for a more interesting uh, back and forth. Also, before I go on, I'd like to point out that all the art and sound effects you see here are, cons are still temporary. They'll be different once it goes live. Up next is Protoss itself. With Protoss, we wanted to look at the gateway units and make sure they're all getting the same amount of use. To that extent, we believe Zealots are a little bit weaker, so we've been looking into buffing their speed post-upgrade. We also looked at harassment units and making sure that the harassment options for Protoss are a bit more evened out. To that extent, we're nerfing adepts uh, through their shade vision range. So now if you shade aggressively, you need to be much more careful as the amount of information you get is lower. We're also reducing Warp Prism's whole amount, which means it has the same amount of shields, but if you're careless, you could lose that prism much more easily. But we're also buffing some of their harassment options with the Dark Templar. With the Dark Templar, we're giving it a blink, which should help it for a later game, as it comes online later game. We also looked at air units, specifically the Void Ray and the Carrier. We wanted to see, promote more of the Carrier Interceptor Micro, and with the Void Ray, we've increased its speed, so it's a bit more of a strike. So with the Dark Templar, before, they do serve a role, and they're very good, up until detection starts coming online. So in the patch, we have introduced a late game upgrade off of the Dark Shrine that will give the Dark Templars a blink that is very similar to the Stalker ability, but does give you some vision of which direction it's moving. So, we also wanted to look at Carrier Micro. And while in StarCraft there are many units you want to target fire down, Fior is most noticeable as a carrier, since it's when you destroy the carrier, all its interceptors will explode. So, another thing about the carrier is that once it deploys its interceptors, as long as you keep the mo carrier moving and the interceptors attacking, it can actually attack further than when it first deployed. So what we wanted to do is we looked into removing the release interceptors ability which was more of a set and forget kind of ability. And we want to move it more towards, we want you to keep your carriers moving, you want to keep the higher range. And right now, the main way you defeat a carrier is kill the interceptors and it'll drain them of resources. So we looked at reducing the interceptor cost from 25 to five, which should allow you to do more carrier micro like this. Up next is the Zerg. The Zerg have a few d interesting changes. The Hydralisk is being seen more as a core unit as opposed to right now where it's more of a pure support unit. To that extent, we've looked into increasing its range and also post upgrade, it'll now gain speed both on creep and off creep. Before it was only off creep that the speed would increase. This will allow it to respond faster and attack more quickly when you have the creep highway. We also looked at the Baneling. We made it more resistant to indirect fire or non-targeted fire by increasing its health on the upgrade with Baneling speed. This way we don't negatively influence Zerg versus Zerg too much. We also looked at Infestors and Swarm Host as sort of Zerg's tech options. With the, with the Infestor, we were looking at Burrow casting, so they'll be very dangerous if your opponent doesn't have detection. And the Swarm Host, we looked at what if its role, we believe its role is correct, but its cost might be too high for what it does. So with the Hydralisk, with that increased speed, increased range, here you can see when a Liberator comes into attack, they now have the ability to attack and kill off the Liberator, whereas before they could not.
So we also have the investor burrow casting, which as a tech option will make it very dangerous if your opponent doesn't have mobile detection following their forces, as you can see here. Also of interest to note here is that, like I mentioned before, these are placeholder. Uh, fun fact, these are the Broodlord cocoons that we're using as placeholder for now. And what this is showing, though, is that unlike many other burrowed zerg, which are very hidden once they're burrowed, the investor is going to be more visible and will have some collision on it. This means that just because it can burrow and move around, once your opponent does get detection, it'll be easier to target them down, and you can't hide them underneath your other units. So with the swarm host, here it is before, trying to be used as a harasser and siege line breaker. It was a good effort, but not quite enough. So we thought that perhaps this role is correct, but we, they've been costed too much for now. So for the same amount of cost, here's how many more uh, swarm hosts you can have. There's another little thing that changed with the swarm hosts. We actually increased the swoop range of those locusts by one. This means that they'll be less vulnerable to anti-aircraft fire and allow more of them to get in range to actually attack their targets. So up next will be Aaron Kirkpatrick to talk about new unit exploration. Hey, everyone. So as David mentioned earlier on, we were looking at accomplishing with this major patch a lot of the same things that we do with expansions. In fact, we think of this as sort of a multiplayer only expansion. And a key part of any expansion is, how, well, it has been the addition of new units. They act as a focus point for new strategies. They add a lot of excitement to the game. And so this was something that we knew we definitely wanted to take a look at, but ultimately did not end up working out. And so I wanted to go into a little bit what we explored, what we tried, and sort of give you a behind the scenes look on why it didn't end up working out, but what did come out of it. So when we started, we were looking at two specific areas. There was the Terran and the Zerg to start with. And we knew that with Terran mech being such a big focus, the Goliath could actually be a really good unit to add here. We get requests to see Goliaths from Terran players quite frequently. It's a very beloved unit from StarCraft I, and so this seemed like a great opportunity to explore adding it, seeing uh, how well it can round out the mech arsenal. On the other side of things, for Zerg, we were really just looking for anything that Zerg was missing. We didn't have anything in particular in mind, but we were thinking that maybe there's some role that isn't being filled or some cool tech option that we haven't thought of. We've often come up with units like that in the past, so we wanted to make sure we were being thorough and really take a look at the, the Zerg race and all other races as thoroughly as we can. So on the Goliath side, we knew we couldn't just take the unit from StarCraft I, bring it over into StarCraft II, and everything would be fine. There's a lot of new threats that Goliaths would have to deal with that weren't there. For example, Void Rays are a very strong anti-armored unit, there was nothing really comparable in StarCraft I, and when we played with it in games, we found that Void Rays would actually just wipe them out very quickly, especially if you had a small number of Goliaths. Also, Mutalisks, although used quite heavily in StarCraft I, couldn't be grouped up in the same numbers as we often see them in SC2. A StarCraft II Zerg player will sometimes bring out like 20, maybe even 40 Mutalisks, 
which really is capable of focusing down small numbers of Goliaths that you're trying to react to harassment with, and it just didn't feel very effective. So when we were looking at what could we do to bring the Goliath up to par, we were thinking about uh, some of the uh, weaknesses that it had here, like AOE would be really good. In order to deal with some 40 mutalisks, having splash damage would be really effective. However, that's already what the Thor does. It does that job pretty well. In fact, it's even more mech-like when it does it. It's not very mobile. You have to really carefully position it. It matches that kind of gameplay we have. And so we were thinking maybe that isn't right, but the Goliath had always been a long-ranged unit, so maybe we could go down that direction. But when we tried that, we found that the Goliath was really acting just as sort of a mech marine in these uh, matchups. You were doing a lot of stutter stepping, you were taking groups of them around and just using them as more of a general all-purpose unit, and we were losing some of that positional feel that we feel defines mech. So we said maybe anti-air isn't the way to go. Maybe it can be a capable anti-air unit, but it's going to have a lot more anti-ground power. Uh, we had noticed that Mech has a hard time claiming map control against other races, so we thought maybe we can do something there, but taking care not to make it feel, again, more like just a Mech Marine. So we were looking at a fast attack speed unit that uh, isn't really used for stutter stepping so much, and was also targeted more on the armored side of things, since the Hellion already deals pretty well at anti-light map control. Now, while we were thinking about that, we also realized, you know, this doesn't really feel like a Goliath at all anymore. It's this unit that's being uh, used for, you know, skirmishes, harassment, mostly anti-ground usage. So rather than just bringing back the Goliath for the sake of it, we were looking at other units like the Cyclone, which weren't being used as much as we'd like to see them, and we thought it could really use a revamp rather than just putting in a unit for the sake of having something new. So. Ultimately, we decided no Goliath, but we were going to take that exploration and put it to good use, and so we still got the gameplay that we found and liked. The Thor, we decided, will be the core anti-air option for mech, but we were going to commit to making any changes we needed to in order for this to be viable. For, uh, Skip went into that with uh, the Tempest range reduction, and we've also looked at tweaking its damage if necessary. And the Cyclone is serving that uh, sort of map control, anti-armored unit role that we had looked at and liked, but didn't feel fit a Goliath. So on the Zerg side, like I said, we were taking a more general approach to things. So we had to sort of think back to when we didn't have as much to go on back in Wings of Liberty. And in Wings of Liberty, we had this thing called the 15 unit max rule, which, as I'll explain in a moment, is really more talking about unit overlap. So the 15 unit max rule was a restriction we placed on ourselves that said we are not going to put more than 15 units on any given race, just period. And it's not because 15 units is some magic number, it's the perfect amount of units that you want in an RTS or anything like that. It's actually just that having that constraint forced us to really choose which units were bringing the most to that race, which were adding the most strategic options, and really forced us to create a very tight and clean set of units that had very clear roles. And we found that although 15 uh, units per race wasn't really the max number for us, as we've added many more since then, it's still that process of saying, what does a unit add to the race? What roles does it fill that we really needed to look at? So going back to Zerg specifically, we started applying this mindset and saying, OK, what roles are currently being filled by Zerg units? What sorts of attack types do they have? What are they used for like in terms of harassment versus main uh, army engagements or skirmishes? And like, what units do they counter? So we look at Zerglings, Roaches, Hydras, etc., anti-light, anti-armor, generalist. And we started playing with some of these and seeing if we just started adding units that we didn't have, what would it be like? An example of this is a tier 1.5 unit, which means that it requires a tech building, but you don't need a lair. And it spawned in groups of three and was very tanky. And the idea here was maybe we could have a tanky unit to buffer for your hydralisks. 
However, when we were doing this, we found that because it spawns in groups of three, it was feeling a lot like a zergling. It was very swarmy, and you were using it in a lot of the spots that you would just want to overwhelm your opponent with a lot of units. And on the high health side, it was feeling a lot like a roach. And since uh, we already have these two roles in, we were finding that we weren't really clear when we wanted to use a zergling, when we wanted to use uh, a roach, or when we wanted to use this new unit. And as somebody fighting it, it wasn't really clear what tech options you'd need to go to defeat Zerg, even if you knew he was going that hydralisk tech, tech path. So it was feeling really muddy. We didn't really like it. And so we moved on to the next unit and tried a new role. And we tried another one and another one. And we tried this for all three races. We did a lot of exploration on the Terran side and the Protoss side as well. But none of them really worked out. That doesn't mean that we didn't get anything out of this, though. As I said earlier, we were able to take these lessons and really apply them to underused units, focus on strategies that weren't seeing as much use, and we think we were able to increase the diversity of the game, and it feels like there are a bunch of new units because stuff is being done in a way that wasn't before, even though we aren't adding anything new right now. With that said, that doesn't mean that we're never going to add new units to the game. This is just the conclusion that we've come to right now. And depending upon what we hear from all of you giving us feedback from how this is playing or any ideas that people bring up, because we've had a lot of really cool stuff added lately that came from the community, that's when we'll be making the decision as far as new units uh, being added to the game in the future. And now to talk about what specifically we're going to be looking at up in the future is David Kim. Hey, uh, so we're going to get into the Q&A section of the panel very soon. So if you guys can start lining up on, I think it's the left side uh, for questions, that would be great. And as you guys do that, I want to talk about what's next for us. And the answer to this question, I think, is a lot simpler than you might expect. Because last year, we had BlizzCon soon after Legacy of the Void released. And then we had the off season to really focus down on polishing and balance testing the changes that just came out to get ready for the new season this year. So because right after this BlizzCon, we're thinking maybe in a couple weeks, we're going to release this to the live game. So it's going to be the same thing. We're going to have to focus heavily on playtesting these changes on the ladder, tuning and polishing these changes so that we're ready for next year. Um, and next year, it's going to be similar as this year as well. Throughout the first half of next year, we're going to have to really make sure that these changes were what really good for the game. Are there any more big changes that are needed to the game, or is it just more focusing down on small changes? These are the questions that we're going to have to answer. And depending on the answer to these questions, the second half of next year will go, uh, potentially go quite similarly, or it'll go differently. But we won't know until we get to that point. Uh, so that's what's next for us. So let's continue working together so that we can make StarCraft II really awesome next year as well. So before you get into questions, um, we actually brought a few copies of Collector's Edition Legacy of the Void, and then we asked the StarCraft II dev development team to sign them uh, to show our thanks to the most dedicated people that came to this panel today, even though the great matches are happening just uh, over there on the arena stage. I think uh, Zest versus Stats is playing right now, and I'm also like super curious who's going to win. Um, but that's what we did. So how are we going to do this is before you ask your question, if you can pick one of three uh, StarCraft races that is your favorite, and we'll roll a dice using Aaron's great um, technology uh, phone that he has. And if you're, we'll go by the expansion level. So if you roll uh, one or two and you've picked Terran, then you'll win, a, you'll win a copy. If you roll three or four and you've picked Zerg, then you'll win a copy that way. And five and six for Protoss. Thanks. Hi, David. Uh, hi, hi, panel. Uh, my name's Mike. I've been playing since StarCraft 196. Uh, just some feedback on Legacy. Uh, the Ultralisk, it just it cripples Terran so much. None of my friends can really keep up when we play now, so it's... That my feedback is that watching an Ultra gut like 30 Marines just makes my heart bleed, and uh, I'm really happy to see Mech being viable, but I really hope you keep flying tanks in. I can't unsee it. Thank you very much. That's it, just feedback. Hey, but you didn't say your favorite race. Oh, Terran, of course. Oh. Terran. Terran. Okay, let's roll for it and see. Drum roll. 
Taryn. You win. You won. <laughs> and uh, speaking of uh, winning as Taryn, I would also mention that we have already talked about, uh, and in fact, we're going to roll out changes to the Ultralisk uh, coming up with the new changes soon, where the Ultralisk will have less, uh, one less armor point uh, after the upgrade, which, although it sounds kind of minor, is actually a pretty huge deal when dealing with Marines. Enjoy the uh, signed copy. <laughs> cool. You mentioned the Cyclone is going to have a different attack for air and ground. Um, how will that prioritize with a unit like the Colossus that's both air and ground for attacks? Well, right now, the way the Cyclone works is that the air and ground attack are not both its auto attack. The anti-air weapon is its lock-on which is actually an ability that you manually activate, whereas its ground attack is its normal attack. So against the Colossus, it would depend on if you have the anti-air attack and you click on the Colossus, it'll lock on and start using that against it. If you do not lock on, it'll use its anti-ground weapon. And you forgot to say a race also. Yes, Protoss. Terran. My phone is biased. It was made by Terrans. Hi, guys. Uh, Excalibur Z, nice to meet you all again. Uh, my question is obviously about the ladder. Uh, so now we have different uh, race MMRs. Uh, third party sites are reporting this as uh, dramatically shifting the rating distributions uh, for these races. What has that done internally? Um, if you can verify those claims, and do you think that it was a mistake to bootstrap uh, new race MMRs uh, from the existing rating that a player has, as opposed to starting them fresh? Yeah, I think you're talking about the post that just came up like a couple days ago, I think. Um, so we haven't had a chance to look into it um, too deeply yet because we were so busy uh, planning for BlizzCon, but it's something that's at the top of our list to talk to our online team about it. Um, and. It is very interesting because when we saw that graph too, it was like, oh, well, like what's going on here? And then uh, I think the top comment said uh, the reason, which makes total sense. So uh, we'll definitely look into it. Favorite race, Terran, by the way. Okay. Terran. <laughs> I think, it's I think Aaron really loves Terran. <laughs> Hi, um, I have a question. Are we going to have some more um, dynamic multiplayer maps like with the lava? So we have to more adapt to the, how the map changes. Oh, so are you saying you want to see that on the ladder? I would like to see on the ladder because StarCraft has already about adapting to the situation. So if we had like the map itself changed. Yeah, so we actually tested uh, something like that, that exact map. And what we found was it was a little bit more restricting for um, strategies than not. And the reason why we found that, I think, is because um, right now, like, say I want to go for an attack, I can go for that attack anytime I want, right? So the opponent has to prepare the whole game. Whereas if, uh, with that kind of mechanic, it says, OK, for x minutes, the lava is up. So you can't attack unless you have air units. So it kind of restricts the options. So we felt like the added complexity plus uh, the restricting uh, some strategies and timing attacks that players can do, uh, we thought was not that great for the game. But next year, one of our main goals for maps is to kind of open up the rule set a little bit. So for example, uh, a lot of people in the community have been asking for uh, maybe different types of uh, different numbers of mineral patches or gas patches per expansion, things like that. And we've been resistant because the game has been quite new up, up, up until this point. So we didn't want newer players coming into the game to be confused. But I think at this point of, of the game, um, there's a lot of experienced players. There's a lot of people helping out new players and so on. So we want to bend those rules a little bit. So that's something that we can definitely discuss next year as well. Also, uh, race is Terran. Zerg. 
<laughs> hey guys. Uh, so first, favorite race is Protoss, and uh, my question is, have you tried these three different units? So I've seen this come up like a few times. I've seen it on Team Liquid. Uh, someone suggested an AA Robo unit for the Protoss, a uh, caster unit for uh, an energy caster unit for the uh, Terran at the factory, and some long range, uh, I don't know, some long range uh, air unit, air to air unit. Uh, are those things that you've tried? Are those, or have there yeah, been other units as well like this? Yeah, I think we've tried various versions of those things. Like, for example, the last thing that you said, um, we tried this um, like bomber type of unit where you launch this fighter out to a target location. You can't really control it. Um, so it goes, does its thing, comes back. And if you are able to save it, then it can go again. Versus if the other guy killed it, then you have to build it again. So that was the counterplay. Um, but it didn't really work out because it didn't f really feel like a StarCraft unit because like the, I think the fun of, Fun thing about StarCraft is you can really have that full control of each unit, right? Yeah. So. And uh, I remember uh, not too long ago, we were actually taking a big look at what we could do in terms of uh, anti-air with the robo, like exploring what that would add to the game. And I mean, we got really out there sometimes. We added a unit at one point that would actually change the attack plane that uh, robotics units would attack. So like while it activated, now your colossi are shooting air. And it would murder Mutalisk. But we found that it wasn't really uh, improving the game it, because uh, robo units are really strong at what they do and making them more versatile was taking away from it And we found that that was true even if we added a more versatile robo unit that robo it, Part of what makes robo so good is that commitment to specific strategies uh, Let me uh, Thanks, uh, you said protoss. Yeah protoss. Yes, <laughs> so I guess that's it. That's what, that was the last copy Hello. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to all of you guys for everything you've done. Um, my question was about Archon Mode. So I think Archon Mode, a lot of people had a lot of really high expectations for how it was going to go, especially going into Legacy of the Void, but we haven't really seen as much participation. Were you guys ever considering opening it up to be allowed to queue up for Archon Mode without a partner, so auto matchmaking? I know there's a lot of hesitation against it, but I think that's something that may help it out a little bit. Yeah, so first, we want to also thank you for making so much great content for all the StarCraft II players in, within the community. Uh, it's pretty awesome to see every time you post one of your um, posts. And um, for Archon Mode, we actually, the reason why we included Archon Mode and um, co-op missions, there was actually a couple reasons. One was we wanted to lower the barrier to entry because StarCraft II is the most competitive game in the world, and we want to keep it that way because we kind of want to have this game where if you think you're a good gamer, then you should play StarCraft II because that's where you can show off your skills the most, right? But at the same time, we still wanted new players coming in. That's why we included these two modes. And the secondary reason for Archon mode was, um, say I have a friend, and he's kind of intimidated by StarCraft II, I can bring him in Archon mode and show him exactly how to play. And in terms of how it turned out, it turned out um, just as well as the bigger team play modes, but it didn't replace 1v1 or anything like that. Um, but I think that's still a great place because it is a good entry point. It is still a good coaching tool and so on. And 1v1, we believe, is the core game for the PvP mode of StarCraft II. Thank you. Hey, I'm just curious, with a lot of other Blizzard games, there's cross-platform integration of do X, get Y. Um, why haven't we seen that a lot with StarCraft II, particularly multiplayer, other than portraits? So do you ever plan on doing like extra unit skins or maybe a new menu map animation to kind of integrate and draw people from more games into StarCraft II? Oh, with other Blizzard games? I think we do do, like, uh, whenever, um, do we? 
<laughs> yeah, that's a great point, I guess. Yeah, we'll definitely look into it. Hi, how's it going? Uh, Hi. First off, I want to thank you guys for making such a great game. And uh, I've really loved it over the years. It's changed my life. Um, my question is about uh, Protoss, uh, how the Mothership Core kind of affects early game micro. So in a lot of other matchups, we see, you know, like Hellions, Lings being used to harass. But the Mothership Core kind of stops that dead in its tracks. Have you explored any units or strategies to harass Protoss early game? So what I would actually bring up is that although this is feedback that we hear, like uh, not too long ago, I was actually just watching a PVZ where there were a lot of lings doing a lot of damage despite the mothership core even activating photon overcharge a lot. So we don't think it's quite as extreme as some people uh, might think. I, I know that it can feel really uh, oppressive playing against it sometimes, but we think that it's actually in a pretty good place right now, but that doesn't mean that we haven't been looking at other options for early game defense or early game harassment on the Protoss side. We just haven't found anything that puts the game in a better state right now. Also, with the new Cyclone change with its anti-armored auto attack, actually makes it very strong versus structures, which is what the um, Mothership Core is going to be overcharging. And also, because it has its anti-air lock on, Mothership Cores have to be very careful about where they position. Hi, David. This question is for you. I mean, we've always known uh, Protoss to be uh, this race of uh, making a big death ball and scary. And now it feels like the other races have more options. Like we've seen uh, Protoss are now like against her doing adepts. And it's like very simple and then it's fragile at the same time. Now with all these changes, I mean, Terran is going to get a uh, siege tank, so it's going to be zone controlled. And uh, other races are getting many changes, but Protoss, it feels like it's going to be limited. I mean, you have the DTs we blink, but that's going to be a high investment. And um, after that, it's like, what do you have left? So what's the future of Protoss is going to be after all these changes? So for Protoss, we want um, each of the tech uh, options as well as the harassment options to be a little bit more um, of a choice. Because right now, as you said, adepts are very powerful. Uh, War Prisms, I think, is another thing where Protoss players uh, tend to lean towards in most games. Um, so by doing very slight nerfs to both, the, both of those things, buffing the Void Ray, like Air Protoss would be more viable now. Um, and as you mentioned, the Dark Templar side is stronger. And we also wanted to explore um, High Templar route a little bit more. Um, and we ended up not doing so because um, there was a lot of disagreement within the community and community uh, members brought up good points towards it. But that's always open as well. But ultimately, we want... Gateway, Robotics, Stargate, and um, the Twilight Tech all to be kind of viable in different situations. Thank you. Hi. When the game launched, the player experience was single player into multiplayer. Now with all the added game modes, how do you see a new player experiencing the game? I think the... Uh... I mean, there's multiple ways, and I wouldn't call any of them wrong. Like, if people want to jump straight into multiplayer, that's great. But with the addition of co-op, I think the most natural transition is to go from campaign into co-op, play with some friends, get used to playing online with other people, and then maybe transition into practicing against the AI a little bit, and then diving into the latter. Uh, I know a couple of people who have actually tried out the game since Void doing that, and they found it to be pretty natural. Hello? Oh, cool. Hello. Uh, so my question is in regards to the, uh, the MMR per race, which is really cool. Um, but I'm finding that um, when you're in the loading screen for a ranked game, it's showing your highest rank, uh, highest league. So I could be a diamond Zerg, and they see the diamond, but I'm Protoss, and it's very deceiving. If I'm like a silver, and it's showing that I'm diamond, I'm wondering if that's on purpose, or what the reasoning might be behind that, if it can show the current one? Yeah, uh, initially we put that so that we show you the, um, the highest potential of the player, um, but I think that's great feedback and we should, uh, we definitely want to explore maybe splitting that out and then for team games, maybe showing the team specific one, um, all that stuff. So we'll definitely discuss that one and try to 
uh, do something if we can. Hi guys, um, I'm just curious if you've messed with the mobility of the Swarm host at all. I like the ideas of what you're doing with it now, but I do feel like it doesn't feel like a traditional Zerg unit, which is high mobility, high, you know, high rate of speed, especially when I'm playing with it, and usually why I don't use it is I feel like it gets lost outside of my army, and it's easy to get caught out of place when you are using it as a harasser. Yeah, so we tried a couple different things, like uh, we tried adding um, deep tunnel to the unit so you can get away easily, or a burrow move to the unit also so that you can uh, remain cloaked as you run away. But we realized the, the threshold between, like if, if it's a little too difficult to kill the swarm host, then it feels, on the opposite side, it feels like, man, I can never kill the swarm host. And as you probably know, if you have like six or seven swarm hosts, you can even take out like a nexus, right? So when we were testing it, it kind of felt like, man, now it feels like um, there's like nothing I can do because like I can never take my fourth base or my fifth base because he has six foremost and it's so difficult to catch them, right? So I think finding that good balance where you can sometimes, especially if you went the counter, if you went like Phoenix, you should be able to counter the the swarm host, right? But it's we I think we have to be careful that we don't cross that line where it feels like it's getting away too easily, so it's just doing way too much, right? But if the changes currently aren't enough, we can explore more, but I think with the mobility, we have to be very careful. Hello. Uh, I would like to talk a couple questions. First one is about new players in general and how they feel very intimidated uh, and kind of tying it in with third-party sites and stuff like that. I think one of the most important things and one of the issues that a lot of players have with 1v1 is they just, it, it's really win or lose, but there's no, there's no one to tell them what they did wrong. There's no one to help them improve. Uh, there are sites like SC2 replay stats as a replay aggregator, stuff like that. Is there any plan to improve maybe the score screen or give options for a player to go more in depth into like, well, I could get supply blocked a little bit less next game and then maybe get some sort of achievement for achieving uh, a certain level of that as opposed to just I lost four times in a row even though I got supply blocked 30% less it feels like I'm just losing every game and I don't want to play anymore uh, do you have any plans for advancing in that or better training or improvement options in general uh, community collaboration is something we've had a big focus on lately and in fact we've been talking about improving uh, community tools inside of the game a lot recently but that actually isn't one that's come up and I think that's a great suggestion so thanks and popular streamers like yourself can also help out uh, new players, right? I try, but uh, that's, that's something I get a lot is, how, how, how do I improve? It's like, well, spend your money. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, sure. A lot of players have that, but the second one is, I, I know you've gone a little bit into detail about it, and with the new map pool for the balance test, uh, you're going with a set of older maps. Uh, do you have any sort of guidelines or testing for map makers or custom maps coming up in 2017? Historically, ha we have had some guidelines and such. We did a blog post about it before the last big map contest we did about like, here's some kind of doodads, uh, don't put a whole bunch of them, don't do a ton of water effects because we all have to make sure the game runs on lots of platforms, including very old ones. Um, I suppose we can look into it again when it's coming up for when we're looking to do more community maps once again. It's sort of like a refresher of like, here's some base rules, here's some kind of like things we're looking for, here's some optimization tricks you can do. I think the biggest oh. one um, that the ar artist would say, I think, is um, it's easy to get caught up on trying to make your map look pretty, so you use way too many doodads, so not all the machines um, can run these maps uh, in a reasonable way. So I think that's a good one to look for. And like I said uh, before, I think the other thing is we want to try maybe stretching out our rule set a little bit on the design side. So if you had cool ideas that you always wanted to try, maybe in the next uh, map contest, uh, we can try out those maps as well. Uh, so maybe having a larger, have you ever considered having a larger map pool with more vetoes to maybe have a little bit more variety? That one's difficult, especially because we try to tie the tournament maps with the ladder maps as well, and we don't want to create such a um, more difficult 
um, situation for players trying to play in tournaments and prepare for tournaments and so on. So we think right now the seven maps with three vetoes is the right number, but um, it is open for discussion as well. Okay, um, my name is Tempo. I'm like your biggest fan. And um, uh, not just kidding. <laughs> but uh, my question is uh, in relation to these major patches, right? Um, I was wondering if your purpose are, is to kind of shake things up at the end of or every season or like WCS season, uh, like after BlizzCon, whether the goal is to actually shake things up or are you trying to maybe do them every once in a while, not necessarily only after the season? Yeah, so our, ul our ultimate goal for StarCraft II to, is to be in a place where the game isn't changing so drastically. So players can really focus down on every single aspect of StarCraft II. That's our ultimate goal. But right now, we felt like we're not quite there yet. That's why we did this major patch. So year to year, we're going to have to see, engage, um, and, and check if we are there yet. Um, so next year, if we're not there, then maybe there's another major patch. But if we are, then that's great. And maybe we switch our focus to doing smaller changes and maybe focus on other parts of StarCraft II instead of changing. Uh, the game design uh, in a major way. Uh, like a a follow-up for that. After this one does go through, um, are you going like, to work to perfect that one? Or th is there ever going to be a thing where you're like, eh, this might not really be working as you start to see it in tournaments and there would be some kind of revert or anything like that? Or is it maybe just like, we just got to go and just try our best to uh, make it the best it can be until the next year? We're going to be watching the patch very closely once it goes live, especially since there's a lot of big changes and a lot of potentially very drastic ones that are going to affect the gameplay, like how you fight against Terran can be very different now, that you have to look for different signals and different build orders. So we're definitely going to be very careful about what, what are players doing, and we're going to make changes as needed and be watching very closely when this patch goes live. And like, uh, like Turtle Biscuits doing the, the show matches for, on the test map uh, very soon, I think, uh, maybe 6 o'clock today. Um, so like, when we were talking to him about it this morning, I was kind of saying, I kind of wish um, there are some broken things that get found so that we can fix those things, whether it's a full revert or a balance change or a design change, um, because it'd be great to find these problems right now and then fix them before they go live, right? Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you for attending the StarCraft II multiplayer panel. Up next, from the main stage, contest.